Are you set? Mm hmm Those are the only ones I know. We are, in fact, live. Sick. Seek. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Tap Calf Transmissions, episode 93-ish, I think. We're getting close to that 100-episode mark. Wow. Uh, speaking of marks, joining me, as always, I'm Corey, is my uh, my co-host, Mr. Justin Platter. Wait, what was the mark tie in there? Uh, I'm just calling you an easy mark for anyone who wants to get some scams off. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I could have been more clear on that. Better or worse marks than me. And I was going to, you're going to hurt my feelings. Oh, well, mm. Templin is in there somewhere, but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll figure that out on our mark tier list next okay. week. We got my buddy Mark. I've never met him. I can't be part of that one. He, uh, Char we were playing Halo the other day. Oh, you were there. After you left, my buddy Mark texted me and was like, your aim is really good, but Charlie's one of the worst Halo players I've ever seen. <laughs> so I made sure to read that message out online. So, yeah. just to rattle Charlie. Yeah, like I was playing like absolute shit all night, but still doing better than Charlie for pretty much the entire time, which was about his average. He's rough. So... He's rough. <laughs> it's the AR. I fucking hate the AR. But anyways... Mm -hmm. Tonight we are going to be talking about Showdown at Center Point. Next week we are going to be talking about the man, or uh, I guess the Mandalorian on Boba Fett. Maybe who knows? <laughs> Probably uh, Book of Boba Fett episodes four and five. That will be. Uh, mm -hmm. There's only four episodes left, so or three episodes. No, there's left. only three episodes. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, things are really heating up there. But any other news we should cover as we uh, as we pop into the finale of this of the Corellian trilogy? Uh, there was a Lego Star Wars tra trailer today, which yep. I thought looked pretty good. Um, have you, other than, are you a big Lego Star Wars player or I'm not a big Lego Star Wars player, but I definitely like the games and this one I think looks good. Um, but yeah. I, I played the old ones. I'm not like, there are definitely some really hardcore fans. I wouldn't say I'm one of those, yeah. but yeah, I definitely like the games. They're, they're, they've got a lot of heart. Yeah. I, I played like, I think only the episode Free one, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm looking forward to re-experiencing all of that in a better version. I played them on my PSP, I think, which was like the per literally the perfect system for that. Yeah. I think mine was like the, I think it was like an a Lego like it was like the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy. Yeah. So, and I missed the PSP. That was that was before its time. Way before its time. If that thing had had a second analog stick, it would have been yeah, li like lights out. I know the Vita had a second analog stick, but that no didn't one gave sell a shit as well. About the Vita. Yeah, which doesn't make sense because the Vita itself seemed like a just an improvement, but it didn't yeah. catch on. Like I did my first indie game as a Vita exclusive mm -hmm. in 2018. Very bad call. So, wait, what? Your first indie game? What are you talking about? Yeah, I released an indie game for the PS Vita. No, you got through a, Sony no, certification and everything? It was a, okay, it was a joke. It wasn't a funny joke. It was a joke about making bad choices, much like the joke itself was a bad choice. So can we just shut the fuck up and move on, please? I gotta say, though, the PSP was, like, the first... was pro When I got that, it felt like the most premium, high-quality piece of hardware yeah. ever. Because it was so much better than, like, the Nintendo DS. Like, my buddy had a DS, and I had a PSP, and, yeah. like, we'd be playing... Like, we'd both get, like, the FIFA game, and his would look like <laughs> dog shit compared to mine. He'd be like, you think I could play yours for a bit? And I'd be like, no, <laughs> you can't. There was one point where I got grounded from using the computer for something. And so I didn't have internet access, but I could go on my PSP and mm -hmm. it had a browser built in. Then my mom, so janky. my mom found out what I, it was like horrible because I was trying to like post on the Thrawn's Revenge forums from my PSP <laughs> and my mom realized what I was doing and that just got me grounded for longer. But I think I using remember, the PSP browser yeah, was punishment enough. I remember I just did not understand how those things worked and I was like, I want to play Flash games and like, sorry, you can't play Flash on the PSP. So I remember going to Flash.com and trying to download it on the browser. <laughs> just not working, obviously. Well, thanks for tuning into the the PSP Reviews podcast. This week, we're going to be talking about Grand Theft Auto Vice City Stories. And next week, we're going to talk about... Uh, shit, it was some yeah. dungeon crawl game I played the shit out of, but... 
forget what it is now. Some sick games, man. Do you ever play the one with the scarecrow? Um medieval i think it was called that sounds that sounds familiar is it, that actually might be luminous thinking? yeah that game was fucking amazing but yeah you know what else was amazing was showdown at center point by roger mcbride allen uh let's, mm-hmm. let's be center point buddies uh mm-hmm. mine is a very gross copy from someone else yeah mine so. too is this one of your yeah, used my, bookstore mine halls? to a library, the library of Jeremy Roberts. I don't know if that's a person or if that's a, if that's like a, an actual Community library, figure. but yeah. yeah. So. My, uh, my copy of Dark Lord is from a library and it's pretty messed up. Like, I think it's the worst call quality book I got from my, my used book halls. It, it's terrible. But. Which is, yeah, you get some, you get some questionable stuff in the used book halls. Yeah. Well, I paid like 20 cents per book tops. There were some that I paid like five cents for. So I think I paid like more mm-hmm. for shipping and got a bucket of like 50 books. I actually, I might have done a, a video sick. opening it on stream. You and did. Seeing it. You did. I don't think you opened it on. Sh- didn't you? Or uh, in a video. I did a, a video. Yeah. yeah. You did a business. I remember. All right. Let's talk about this book. First of all, it felt very short to me. I crushed this in three hours. Yeah. The first half of the book kind of dragged on for me, but then I got really into it with the second half. I read it pretty fast, but... Okay, this book was... helped me figure out one of the main things that differentiates a middling Star Wars book or even a good but not great Star Wars book. It's something that's really exciting and good, like the Thrawn trilogy. This book Because it and... has it or lacks it before we... This before book we... lacks it. Okay. The thing that I'm going to... Or rather, it has the problem. And this is something I was thinking about this because the uh, Black Fleet crisis has the same problems as well. Okay. And books that I like more, like Courtship of Princess Leia, don't. This book spends way too much time talking about what's happening instead of actually showing you or doing it. It spends yeah. too much time talking about how everyone's scheming. It talks too much time, spends too much time, um, you know with the characters trying to figure out what's going on and talking things through. That's not something you usually see in a star Wars movie. It's action. Um, and like in the, it, of course there is, you know, they talk about the scheming of the throne trilogy, but it's for short periods in between big, exciting set pieces. This book, I mean, not much happens in the first two thirds of it. The, the last third I thought was really good. But for the first two thirds, it's like very small events with the characters really just talking and trying to figure out how this um, whole kind of situation has can't come about and what the ultimate goal is. And I think that is one thing, same with Black Fleet Crisis, had that yeah. problem even worse, that kind of holds it back a bit. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't even mind the, the talking about stuff before it happens, but like, a good chunk of the book is planning the one thing that's going to happen, mm-hmm. like the kids uh, trying to figure out the repulsor. They do have the escape sequence in there, but... But I think you're right. There is a lot of uh, of setup and a lot of saying like, oh, this kind of thing is going to happen or this kind of thing is happening rather than mm-hmm. showing us like it actually happening or mm-hmm. examples of what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, and again, to compare it to the Thrawn trilogy, that book knows really, you know, really well how to intersperse action sequences, whether it's like the escape from Kashyyyk one of Luke's many, you know, Luke's in the fighter and he's fighting against the Star Destroyer, one of Thrawn's battles. That is always mixed in in a way that kind of matches, you know, Star Wars as movies. Because, like, if you look at even A New Hope, you think, oh, yeah, all the action's at the end, but really there's a lot of action sequences just spread out. You got the battle at the beginning, you got the brawl in the cantina, all of those kind of... You don't stay in one spot for too long. You've got a good kind of feeling of adventure. And, Yeah. Yeah, like you you open up with uh with Han's cone ship uh fun, which that that had a lot going on in it. But then after that, that was a very a, long sequence. Yeah. Probably pages. a bit too long. Mm-hmm. But that that might be why it took me a while to kind of get into the book. I read like forty pages in my first sitting and I was like, Oh, this is gonna be Which is the cone thing. ship stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But uh yeah, after that they're kind of just talking on Salonia about how the Salonians talk too much. Which is mm-hmm. a little bit ironic, I guess, but yeah, and kind of everybody is talking, you know, like there's 
one point where because they're kind of split into three groups so as a bit of summary for those who haven't read the prior two books basically there's a super weapon in the Corell well first of all there's a big series of uh kind of revolts in the Corellian system which we've discovered is kind of a uh it's kind of hiding a front yeah it's hiding the fact that there is something much more nefarious going on um and this big super weapon this unknown super weapon is being pointed at stars and can blow them up. So this is book three of the trilogy. And by this point, the group is kind of split up into three groups, I guess. We've got Leia and Han uh, are together. Uh, we've got the kids, Jason, Jaina, uh, and Chewie as well. And then we also have Lando and uh, and the, Luke. The, the three solo kids, Jason, Jaina, and Chewie. Yeah, Jason, Jada, and Chewie <laughs> after Star. <laughs> well, no, I guess Chewie's gone by then too. Yeah. But um, and then of course Lando and uh, Lando Luke meet up with Han and Leia, and then at the very end, of course, they're all reunited. Yeah, so they've got to stop Center Point, which is the giant super weapon from firing on these systems. Uh, it's the Borgo Yarvin something, mm-hmm. some, some mm-hmm. consonants like that. Uh, that's gonna be blown up with. In- yeah, that, rem- that reminded me I haven't done my Wordle for today yet, so thanks. It's true. <laughs> uh, I, me and Dan have been doing them at like 12.06, right before going mm-hmm. to bed. So, mm-hmm. the, yeah, so the center point has blown up two systems so far that are pretty sparsely populated, and this third one is going to be the first one with a lot of people there, so they're really hoping to stop that, but it's on this preset path of path of destruction. It's joining Darth Bane. And they need to figure out a way to shut it down, shut it all down before before that happens. Mm-hmm. And they do. Yeah. Um, because they're also, there's also the fact that they're kind of in beyond enemy lines at this point um, because they're in there with a small force. There's, for the first part of the book anyway, there's a big uh, kind of blackout of communications and they also can't jump through hyperspace. And they don't have the means to conventionally destroy this giant super weapon either. Yeah. So they've they're basically going to be using Anakin to try to activate the planetary repulsor on Drawl, which every planet in the Corellian system has a repulsor that can interfere with firing center point. They just need to be able to get into it. And mm-hmm. the whole system is kind of uh, tuned to Anakin's brainwaves and DNA, which comes back into into play in Legacy of the Force when... In a very weird way. <laughs> yeah, when Heck and Thrak and Sal Solo goes mm. and makes like a weird, messy-looking android Anakin that's the size of a room, and it's this... I don't know if it... it it's it's a droid, and... I think it's I think it's a droid. It's been a while since I've read that part. Yeah, but it's like a weird droid thing. It thinks it is Anakin, and then Jason has to go and talk to it. Or Ben mm-hmm. does. I think it's Ben that does it because Jason's yeah, off ben. hunting Thraken. But yeah, it, it's very weird. But everything in this trilogy kind of sets up for the second Galactic Civil War in that way. Because mm-hmm. uh, they need Anakin, who's dead by then, to actually fire center point if they ever want to do it again. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely quite far off from this point, obviously. Um, there's some other kind of lasting implications in this book as well. Uh, I guess the biggest one besides for center point does play into the Yuzhan Vong war and legacy. Yeah. We do get Tendra as well, who, d- who doesn't just become Lando's cutie pie GF in this book, but she does go on to uh, marry him and even uh, help create little Lando jr. Yeah. She's what in her thirties and he's pushing 60 or 70 by now. I don't think he's quite that old in this one. It's 20 years. Out. Okay, so he'd probably be about 50. Yeah, because he's like in his 70s by like legacy, yeah. like late 70s and legacy of the forest. So that's true. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's 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 a uh, I, I thought the relationship was interesting. Actually, it, it was believable for me. Um, well, the big development in the relationship here is that uh, until the end where they are actually reunited, it's that. Lando doesn't take the chance to hook up with uh, the the, the leftover manager of Center Point yeah, Station. Manager, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was a funny moment. She's like, "Well, aren't you going to try?" And uh, he's like, "No, I don't think so." And she's like, "Damn, I don't know how I would have re- responded to that." Yeah. Gariel and uh, Belindy had a bet going, and he just kind of ruined that for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. 
Tendra doesn't of- really actually show up in any books. Like she, there's very little that she actually shows up in. Usually she's just mentioned as standing near Lando somewhere. I, yeah, I, I think the most she appears is probably like she's in Fate of the Jedi a little bit. Yeah. Um, especially the early books, like at Lando's mine and stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's like I recently reread the NJO and Lando's not in it a huge amount. He's in it a fair mm. bit. But Tendra, I don't think she says more than two things in 19 books. No. Yeah, Even though sounds... they have Tendrando arms and they're making battle droids for the Galactic Alliance. That is true. I forgot about that. <laughs> they they do have the, uh, the spooky battle droids with the combined. And yeah, often we're just kind of learning about how like she's she's described as like a shrewd businesswoman. Yeah. Um, so like she's like kind of also financing a lot of Lando's schemes like yeah. later on, like the uh, the mine on Kessel is like a Tendronjo thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I guess she would have been around by the time of Young Jedi Knights. Yeah, I guess I guess that's true. But, uh, but yeah, I I did actually enjoy pretty much all the characters in this. There's obviously some differences mm-hmm. from what we get later. Uh, I'm not sure what the release order is from this and Young Jedi Knights, like how close they came out together. But Jason and Jaina almost flip here where Jaina's making bad jokes and Jason's chastising mm-hmm. her for it. Jason's yeah. the one that's flying uh as it's his place to be in the pilot seat fought like father yeah. like son this came out three years before young jedi knights okay so really mm-hmm. it's kevin j anderson and rebecca Meister that uh that messed that one up mm-hmm. yeah well yeah but they can go back and fix it fine. Fine. yeah there's there's some time too like they're quite a they're like what five years older in those books as yeah. well they're so. nine here in anakin seven yeah and they're like 15 or 14 in the yeah. in young jedi knights so yeah, yeah it fits Young Jedi Knights is like two years before the Vong invade, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very sad. Um, yeah, very, very sad. I, I miss talking about those books. But. One thing that I don't that I don't understand about this book is suddenly everyone seems to fucking hate Admiral Osilage. Yeah, well, I mean, he's he's kind of a dick, but like, I don't know. There's like the funniest thing, too, is like, well, it's not funny, but at the end, um, He's like remarking about how shitty children are. Yeah. And like, Gary Captain's is just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And then he just dies. Yeah. He's kind of, he's very, like, he gets very shitty in this book. But in the mm-hmm. prior book, Luke kind of remarks on being uncomfortable with how comfortable he is with going into a battle or a war or some enthusiasm he seems to have with it. But even then, Ocelage is kind of like tampering or tamping that down a bit. And you get into this book, and Luke pretty much immediately is like, oh, no, fuck you in particular. I don't remember. Mm. Maybe I just I'm forgetting stuff that happened in book two, but I don't know. I, it just seems like uh, they went. He went into this one writing, uh, just just wanting to to shit on Ocelage. I was Ocelage and droids. Yeah, people don't give it two shits about droids in this. Like C three PO is legit. Like one of the MVPs of figuring all this out, and mm-hmm. everyone like can't. N- people are like constantly like holding back the urge to tell him to go fuck himself. Like every two minutes, they're like. Yeah. They're like, C-3PO just gave me chest compressions and saved my life. I woke up and had to spit in his face. It's like, just like, <laughs> chill out a bit. Well, the droid characters did actually get a bit worse here, too. Like, Q9 I really liked in the in the prior books. But here, he just turns really wide. He's like, he him and Ocelage get the same kind of mm. downgrade in it. Yeah, I thought it was a bit disappointing, too, how little time we spend with, um, I forget his name, the mentor. Ibrahim? Yeah, Ibrahim um like a lot of the storytelling comes from his aunt this time yeah she's like a fine character but ibrahim was a really interesting character especially in the first one yeah. where he's kind of like this just i don't know like non-educated philosopher basically mm-hmm. uh, that was kind of interesting uh do either of them actually show up again let's see i feel like ibrahim gets mentioned somewhere but I don't, I don't know, because uh, she's gonna get installed by Le- oh god, there's a picture of him like poking out behind Q9. Where's this <laughs> from? Official Star Walking Wars away. fact file. No, it, it's it's a a full color image. I'm gonna I'm gonna download this. I'm gonna put it up on the screen for everyone. But he's like this little rat poking up from behind a droid. <laughs> 
But I feel like he gets mentioned at least a bit in either NJO or Legacy of the Force. Let's I see. wouldn't be surprised. I want to. I want to look that up. Up on stream for everyone now. Uh, there is a, a a black and white drawing for him as well. Okay, he he shows up in uh, Agents of Chaos as well. Of course he does. That's probably the same one with um, Gary L. Capdison's daughter, is it? Uh, actually, I think that might be later. I think mm. she comes in almost in. Yeah, that would have been in Force Heretic, the last. Oh, yeah, I just saw the picture. <laughs> oh, there's a nah. picture of Marcia as well. I just imagine him like if he's gonna make one sound, it's just gonna be. Nah. And Marcia does get mentioned in uh, in NJO too. Mm -hmm. She's gonna be Governor General. What That's about cool. Melinda or Belindy, whatever her name is? Belindy Kalenda does show up as well. Kind of liked her as a character. She was she was kind of cool. Yeah, like NJO has a lot of people just showing up for stuff. Appearances. Yeah, she's an NJO a lot. Okay. Okay, cool. She's still like an intelligence person. Yeah. Okay. I forget if she was involved with any of the Alpha Blue stuff. But probably sick, right. sick fuck. This is just my new profile picture now. If you're going to be. <laughs> there we go. It's nice. Yeah, it's nice. Fucking the Corellian system just home to horrors. We got <laughs> we got nonstop banging otters. We got those things. We've got humans, worst of all. Yeah. I mean, to, to what you said before about like everyone just dismissing uh, the droids, they make a point of that being one of the failures of Thraken, where like he just dismisses the capabilities of the Wookiees and the droids, and mm -hmm. or the Wookiee, the Drawl, and the droids. And mm -hmm. that kind of is what leads to part of his downfall, as well as the children, but like especially his humanocentric yeah, ways. He doesn't realize that maybe his uh, nephew can probably be a sick, epic pilot. Yeah, but there's like there's everyone else in the book making the same dismissive uh, mm -hmm. treatment of of droids, and a bit at Salonians as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe who's who are the real evil people here? Everyone. Yeah. That's the yeah. true message. Humans. Bracken Humans. was right all along is what that means. They should have just blasted the Corellian sis or the uh, Cor Coruscant's son. Yeah. Like, let's be honest. Save the galaxy. A couple no years of anarchy, worry about it'll it. sort itself out. No problem. No problem. Take notes, JJ. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. Um... So I, I gotta say I did like the, I did like the final battle. Um, you don't this, despite the fact that people you know you'd expect it to with the expanded universe. You don't really get that many moments where everyone's sort of flying in like that, and you get all the different perspectives. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, it's a very small battle for what it is too. Like mm -hmm. they're they've got just the three Bakurin ships left because the fourth one went and died. I'm. It it seems like they're just sending small elements of the Corellian fleet at them, uh, mm -hmm. one at a time almost. I don't know if they're like covering other entrances or if they're just like doing this RPG style where like you've got your party <laughs> made up and you've got to send them in. But yeah. it works out for them. They crush the they crush the thing. It doesn't really it doesn't really tell you much about the actual defeat of the triad though. Like their fleet dies, but they mm -hmm. don't address. I don't think they addressed anything with the triad themselves. Well, do they? all they really say is that the triad was very cooperative now because the uh, the New Republic was on its way. Basically, I think the triad was actually one of the weakest parts of the book. Well, was um, that the triad or was that the uh, the I guess this the Salonians on Sicoria? It's both because it mentions it, but... the triad is coming because or it mentions the triad is cooperative, too, because they were the ones who okay. pre programmed the uh, the kind of shots in the center point station yeah um so they're like there's two options to fix things either we we can fire one of the repulsors again or we can uh unprogram deprogram sorry rather center point station and the the triads being quite cooperative because um yeah i just thought the triad was kind of a weak you know ultimate bad guy yeah because 
they're hardly mentioned before this point. Yeah. Um, we do hear of some buildup of ships, um, but when you read that in book one, you kind of just assume it's part of the greater revolution that's happening. Yeah. So it's a bit weird to bring them in at the end because it's like, okay, like what do they want? Who are they? Like, like what are their ambitions? So it's, it's kind of a weird, it's like, it's almost like a deus ex, uh, machina or whatever it's called where, but they're, they're explaining away the bad guy at the end. Yeah. It, so I, I generally like what the themes of the book are trying to do. Uh, but I don't like kind of the implication that it's easy to deal with this kind of nativist situation because it's all being manipulated from outside and no one actually believes those things anyways. Mm-hmm. So you just cut the, one of the many heads off. Cause like is there's the Thracken element. There's the triad element. We don't really hear much about the Sikorian triads ultimate goals for it, whether they are trying to do the same thing as Thracken or Mm -hmm. if Thracken's goals were his own and the Sikorian tribe was going to do something slightly different with it. But Mm -hmm. we can kind of assume they would have been aiming for a similar situation, even though they weren't taking any credit for anything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, it just, it just feels like it, it weakens it a little bit when they say, okay, we can ignore all the, all the revolts and populist sentiment because mm-hmm. uh, that's all fake anyways. That, that That's not going to solve any problems in actual practical application. Yeah, I was like also reading this back. Um, I mean, I, sorry, I was thinking back as I was reading it. And I was like, because I, I kind of forgot that, there, that the triad was behind it. And it's like, is that any more interesting than it just being a big plot of... Um, Thraken or somebody else yeah. and I don't think so like I was like did I forget that the Empire is somehow involved here hmm. like that's almost what you'd expect right well it, it adds in the way for there to be a connection with the the draw or with uh with the Overden at least in the in the draw lists mm-hmm. but yeah because Thraken would never have been able to make those connections yeah. so you need some element of that but yeah I, I kind of felt like Maybe Thraken was doing like the Palpatine thing where he's like not actually racist. He's just yeah. using, you know, racial division to gain power. But to be fair, in the books, you can see that he's actually like he is like incredibly racist. Like, xenophobic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like you could still have them be these individual planetary movements that then just come together for international fascism and <laughs> end up fighting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's kind of what the Axis was doing. Yeah, totally. Did, did none of these people watch or read The Man in the High Castle before? Mm-hmm. But I get like having the, the shadowy Sikorian triad of all the species working together to make all those species not work together. At some point going up the ladder, you're going to get that. So it could have just as easily been Thraken. And yeah. ultimately, the Sikorian triad, if their goals are no different than Thraken's, it really is just is Thraken. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. It was Agatha um, all along. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what a Star Wars Man in the High Castle would look like. <laughs> Palpatine's got his holiday special DVDs that he's distributed. <laughs> he's got to consult, consult it every time you want to make a decision. Yeah. I don't know. People in Legends or in Canon getting books about the all, the other timeline. Mm-hmm. Some weird dimensional flickering. That's how they're going to introduce Star Wars Legends back. It's mm. going to be like it's going to be like midway through episode ten in a weird like someone's going to go through a wormhole for a second and they're going to show up in like the middle of like the glove of Darth or the glove of Darth <laughs> Vader or something. Like what the fuck is this? Well, you come out during the Battle of Coruscant and use on Vogue. It's like wait a minute, this is shit. Too. I don't want to live here. <laughs> it's it's bad, just in a different way. <laughs> We're all going to die regardless. Yeah. Do I want to be killed by plants or do I want my planet blow up? I don't care. <laughs> it's just different which planets blow up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh also I will say the center point station is I don't know if we get as much of a description of like its mechanics later on. Like in Legacy of the Force and um Yeah. And uh the the New Jedi Order. But for what I don't think we do in the New Jedi Order, because I think it kind of ignores the 
the, the hyperspace travel time of like yeah. the projectile. Um, well, it's it is... like ripping a hole in hyperspace, and with it, the whole repulsor lift element of it was kind of weird. But but it, it's very it is very Starkiller base like in a way. Yeah, where it like seems to fuck with hyperspace, and I mean it it just it it doesn't shoot like a projectile in the same way. It kind of just causes the star to blow up. Um, yeah. But it like harnesses, you know, a natural energy. In this case, it's like gravity, I guess. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, and in Starkiller Base, it's obviously the star. Um, but yeah, I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. They do go into a fair amount of detail on like, oh, this is where all the power generates. The light and hollow town is actually mm -hmm. uh, the charging beam. So we probably shouldn't live in here if people are going to use it. But I, I think in... Uh, in NJO and in Legacy of the Force, they've kind of moved back into Hollow Town. Yeah, I think so too. And they were still firing it, and like maybe they evacuated people in NJO before they did it. But I, I don't think Thraken was that concerned about it because it was him back in control, basically. Because like, mm -hmm. spoiler alert: despite being the world's worst person, Thraken gets essentially elected as the actual yep. leader. Yep. And, and yeah, I. I I think I remember in uh, in Legacy of the Force, especially when they're trying to get it back up and running, like Jason goes through Hollow Town mm -hmm. and there are people there. So I, I just I wouldn't just, move there myself. It's so funny, like, you know, like the the Celestials or, or whoever are just like looking back at basically it's like stupid people building a, a city in like the mouth of a gun. It's like, <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? So there's like a bunch of that in this book. You've got Hollow Town. It's like it's just people see a giant, you know, floating ball of energy. And it's like, hey, this must be for warmth. Not like it's actually like a pilot light. Or we, it's like it's also when they're parking or where they're and then the repulsor, they set up base camp right on like the big uh, energy kind of manifest or whatever. So it's like, well, Lando does bring up that like they were done building Corellia with it. So it's entirely possible that the mm -hmm. Celestials, he doesn't know it's the Celestials. Like maybe they built up some Killick mounds in there at the start, and that's how people started living in there. Mm. But yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. But like, it's just like humans are like, "Ooh, bright thing." It's like, let's go near here. Oh it's no! Like, it's like all those uh, all those ships from World War Two that turn into into reefs, basically. So all the fish go and live in them, even though they're a bunch of giant cannons. You don't expect that's them true. to fire again. Like you, you're not expecting some seven and a half year old to hack his way into the cannons and fire them to stop the planet blowing up. And just like that, there have surely been marine life killed by unexploded ordnance that was sunk yeah. accidentally with the ship. <laughs> yeah, that happens to people. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem. It's yeah, just Diana was effect. trying to do a lot about it. Yeah. Support then, her efforts in that. And then big ordnance got her. <laughs> Oh man, the monarchist Susie emailed us is not gonna like that one. <laughs> I know I, I don't know what the monarchy's position on Diana was. I think they were okay. Oh, speaking of monarchy, there's a high school in Dartmouth called Prince Andrew High, so now they gotta change Oof. the name of that. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know if they're gonna go with child rapist high. I'm gonna assume not. I mean you but... can't call it Prince Albert either, because that's got its other connotations too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dickering high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i thought that was and you know what's else they it's six it's a 60 year old school they named it when he was born like you're gonna name it after a baby yeah because they they're into that sort of thing i guess but it's like they always name like no one expects the royal family is gonna do, do something <laughs> untoward that's never happened before yeah never that's why there's no cities that still have King Edward the Nazi High. <laughs> yeah, we had to Halifax had to also um change all the Cornwallis, even though Edward Cornwallis he like helped found the city, but he also like scalped a million people. So probably not super epic to have his name everywhere. Venerating people to that degree is just a bad idea in general. Yeah, I, I think kind of the new approach of things around here, at least, is don't nothing is named after a person. Yeah, just uh, don't do even it. like, yeah. See, the only like even 
so like there was the big mass shooting last year and like there's some discussion about naming it after the rcmp officer who died even still i just think they're gonna say nope no more people like people turn out to be you know not epic sometimes well that's why it's it's a good it's it still happens with john a mcdonald like people name stuff after him there oh yeah we had john a mcdonald high school here too that got changed we don't have quite the same veneration for our founding uh for the fathers of confederation as like the american founding fathers because like if people know two things about john a mcdonald it's that he was like a huge alcoholic and he liked trains there's not the same like hero worship for residential schools yeah like no one started off (laughs) that uh that big on him so hopefully it's like there, there's fewer well, things. Yeah, we named also after don't him. like pledge allegiance. I mean, we do have Okanda, but we we don't. It's just, we do have uh, we have a pledge of allegiance. Do we? But I mean, we don't do it in school every day. Is what I was gonna say. No, one of my schools we had to. And oh, really? It was weird because we I went to one where we Canada. didn't, and then we had uh, something else after it, and it was it was very what the fuck creepy. Is the f- Canada has a pledge of allegiance. Oi. The oaths of allegiance. Wayne's fit, ain't she? <laughs> we had to do that every day. <laughs> it's uh, the the Canadian oath of allegiance is made to Gordy Howe, Bobby Orr, and Wayne Gretzky. Though it's a little bit different. Yeah, it's like Shadow saying there. Uh, it, it's like getting someone's name tattooed on you. you. You don't know where that's going. Just don't do it. Even if it's your wife of five years, it's like you know, there's still yeah. time for that to go sour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or you could retroactively discover something that made that go sour. <laughs> yeah. Fictional characters don't even qualify for this either. Like, you never know if they're going to go back and make a special edition of the movie or the book where it turns out that they were terrible the whole time, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if there's a lesson from here. Just, yeah. We, what we, we're we, saying we... is that the New Republic naming the Thrak and Sal Solo Community Center when they did, <laughs> big mistake. <laughs> The Thrack and Cell Solo Center for kids who can't read good and <laughs> I can't take his name seriously because I always want to put Heck in before it. Just yeah. Heck and Thrack and it just goes together. Even though he's it also just but... like it reminds me of like South Park where they and I guess it's I think it's originally from Star Trek, but anyway, where they go to the parallel dimension. Yeah. And it's the bad version of the characters and they're the exact same, but they have a goatee. <laughs> yeah, he is literally that guy. Yeah. And then at the end, uh, the end of that episode for people who haven't seen it, it's like classic South Park episode. I think it was like season two, maybe it was like the Halloween special and it's got the big spooky frame, the spooky vision. It's just so fucking hilarious. And it's got a, who is it? Who's on it? I think it's like Barbara Streisand. Anyway, at the end, it's like they've got to kill all the people from the, uh, the dimension, like from the other dimension. So there's like evil Kyle, evil Stan, but Cartman's alternate dimension version is nice Cartman. Um, <laughs> but at the very end, so like they're at the very end, it's like Kyle's got the gun. He's trying to figure out which one to kill. And Cartman rips the other one's goatee off. So he can't tell which is which. Um, and he accidentally kills nice Cartman and evil Cartman remains. And it's just, it's a really funny moment. Classic, classic TV. Classic. Right up there with man bear pig. I never thought man bear pig was that funny. Neither did I. South Park's had a few bad takes. One of the other really bad takes, I mean, I guess that take takes not like ostensibly anti-environmentalism, but one of the one of the worst ones that I remember from early on was the the anti anti smoking episode. Yeah. Well, the problem the South Park thing is they do a lot of really good stuff, but fundamentally, what they're if you just boil it all down, what they're against isn't any particular set of ideas. It's caring about things. Yeah. So if if you care about something, <laughs> that's what South Park is making fun of, which is not mm-hmm. right. Yeah. My other problem with South Park too, especially like the, it's just it's too on the nose now. Like the, I guess like and the best the best example of that would be like the principal. Uh, what's his name? The uh, he's PC like the principal. PC principal. It's like, that's a funny gag, but it's like when that's like six seasons in six seasons in and it's like the it used to, you know, there used to be political commentary, like the whole episode about Big Gail, Big Gail's Big Gay Boat Ride. That was like a pro gay message. It's like Stan's got a cat who's gay and it's like 
you know what that's actually okay and you know obviously that's not that controversial now but yeah because the thing they were making fun of there wasn't being anti-gay it was caring that much about being anti-gay yeah but i'm uh, well i don't know i i think that was a bit more of a cut and dry pro gay message yeah i i mean like if you boil down to the fundamentals of where they come from when they're choosing which side of things to be on Mm -hmm. like i'm not saying they themselves would wouldn't be like pro gay Mm -hmm. marriage uh being legal just that the way they approach writing the episode is usually more from uh Mm -hmm. whatever side is most enthusiastic for something right and I, i guess the only thing i'm saying is that it didn't feel like it was always like that like the earlier episodes were a lot more i guess irreverent in a way where like they are completely silly and any um <laughs> funny me like complaining about shoving politics in a thing but but the political message was always there in some respect but it was presented in a much more interesting and nuanced way even though like you know big gales big gay boat ride is not necessarily nuanced <laughs> but it's a lot more nuanced than the the smug coming from San Francisco, which is funny, but it's not like it's not as good. Yeah. yeah. So, well, usually now it's like season long arcs, isn't it? So it's. Yeah, it gets a lot more run into the ground whenever they're doing anything. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because back in the day, you're right. Like I'm trying to think for like, the, I did like a rewatch of like the first 10 or 12 epi- or seasons. And I, I'm probably cutting this any... all out of the out of the posted episode. anyways. No, you're not. Um, I was just trying to think of anyway. Enough about South Park. I I think it's a really funny show, but I, I don't watch it anymore. I think it's gone down downhill. I got but, really back into it when I worked at McDonald's for like that was just when my coworkers were back into it. So I started watching it all the time, mm-hmm. and then I just kind of fell off it again. It was pretty good yeah. for one of the seasons there, but then you know. I mean, it's still funny. Like it's impressive that it's still funny considering it's been on TV for so long. Um considering like what's happened to the Simpsons and other shows. I mean, if you've been around for that long, you're going to have to jump the shark because you're just, you only put your characters in so many situations without it getting more and more crazy. I used to watch like every episode of the Simpsons well after everyone thought it turned to shit because like I was still watching by like season 29 or 30, but it's just got so hard. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Uh, Anyways. Star Wars, the uh, the showdown at Center Point, uh, they they showed down, and I think we kind of covered most of the book. Luke mm-hmm. does, Gariel dies, unfortunately, one of the first, uh, chronologically, I guess, the first character introduced after Endor, and she dead now. So Luke becomes a, a godfather. Sort of. Well, it's not specifically or explicitly mentioned until she comes back up in NJO, I think. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure if Mara is aware of this fact. Yeah. And I mean, Luke also doesn't really do anything for her. I mean, we get a little bit about it, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to mention. Um, just scrolling through here or looking through. No, I mean, I, I enjoyed this book. I definitely really liked the how Mara was brought in and how the yeah. characters all kind of actually had something to do in the last battle. Yeah. And that was cool. They sort of had their Avengers moment where everyone's, you know, this is Luke, this is Mara, this is Lando. Everyone's kind of getting ready. Yeah. Like if uh, Q9 and Oslage got worse as time went on, Mara got better. She like started off mm-hmm. as the like swashbuckling pirate and then turned into yeah. more of a, an actual human character. Yeah. So, yeah, she shows compassion when like the kids get kidnapped, which of course that happens. It's a Star Wars book with children in it. They're going to yeah. be kidnapped. <laughs> Look, it just goes without saying. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've got too much else. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, No, I think that is basically my opinion on the book. What are you going to give it in your your big list of i'm rankings. giving it the average so let's you're say giving it a we, c yeah i liked okay. it but just a c for me i think i'm gonna I'm, i might change this one later i'm gonna give it a b okay i think I've, it was I definitely above average definitely respect me. that it was very it one thing that i appreciate it didn't overstay its welcome um yeah. like i feel like black fleet crisis sometimes did 
Mm-hmm. I don't even know if that book was any longer. I assume this was, I've got the whatever edition. Um, this got shorter as it went on for sure. Yeah, this book is 300 pages exactly. I'm trying yeah. to figure out what, which edition I have. I've got the soft cover. Um, I think it's the original 95, maybe. Yeah, I got the 95 print. Mm-hmm. Um, first edition, 300 pages. So that's not a lot. Yeah, I think uh, the Black Fleet Crisis books were all longer than this. Mm-hmm. It, it felt longer with the with the way the plots ended up working out in that one, at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, but oh, we did actually put in our rankings for the last ones. We do need to update the the public facing side of this spreadsheet because oh yeah, I forgot to do that. It uh, it doesn't quite show. So you would you went. Th- Three, I think so that's C. C is three. I went B is four, mm-hmm. and there we go. You know what? I, you know what? I I'll give it a B, I'll give it a B too. Actually, I, I give it a I B. Think, All yeah. right, for the ending, the ending was good enough. Yeah, um, yeah. It it picks up for the last hundred and fifty pages for me, so that's kind of where I'm at with it. Mm-hmm. But uh, let's let's do a quick look here for what we did for the series. We both gave ambush and assault a, a C. And we're putting a B for uh, for showdown. Oh, that's what we don't have on it is we skipped putting on uh, yeah, fallen star, which I, I gave think, that a three, I believe. I think you gave it or a three. Did I give it a two? No, I don't think either of us gave it below average. Okay. Yeah. No, I think you're right. You went three. I think I might have gone four there as well. Mm-hmm. One thing that I kind of think about the other two books that I missed about this was actually talking about Corellia because this takes place in the Corellian system, but we get very, very little about the planets. And the first book does a good job of kind of doing some interesting world building. Mm-hmm. Um, and this book gets kind of none of that. Like You get a fair bit with the Solonians as the a Solonians, species. Yeah. But... That's true. Yeah. And in the background, just... if you listen carefully, you can hear Corin having sex with one of them. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what that would sound like. What do you think? Can you can you make can you make your best sound impression of that? No. Okay. Oh, well, I can't. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Where does that put us on eyes. average? <laughs> so you have more averages and slightly above average still. I have more mm. A's and more D's. Okay. You you give stuff more of the middling ranks. I go more for the slightly above or below middling, but we're still dead tied on. Uh, S tier and Fs. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. But for anyone who's keeping track at home, that's how we feel about things. Fair so, enough. We have some emails. Did we get any reviews though? I'll check that as you read the first email. As I read, I the checked. First I checked email. a couple days ago. And I didn't see anything. Well, let me check again. All right. Our first question comes from Tony. Who says, I found out about the podcast a few months ago and I quickly binged all of it. It inspired me to read and collect every Star Wars novel, even though I'm a broke college student. Recently, I was able to finish collecting NJO and I've about 90 books so far. My question for today is, what do you guys think of the Bounty Hunter Wars trilogy, not the recent comic? Especially considering how it compares to the book of Boba Fett, uh, seemingly taking Boba in a different direction than Legends. Oh, Bounty Hunter Wars? Oh my goodness. I haven't read that since I was a kid. I yeah, remember I had one of the books that had, uh, I think Darth Vader on the front, but yeah, no, I I don't remember very much about Bounty Hunter Wars at all. Yeah, like Boba's a character in Legends that gets kind of reset every couple years. Yeah, where like there's a bunch of very different portrayals of him. So there's like the. Uh, not sure like more traditional values boba that shows up for a few books Volso. there's the yeah the boba of like njo and afterwards where he's actually a maybe a slightly harder version of what we're getting in uh in mm-hmm. book of boba fett yeah he even has sort of that family angle yeah because like there's a the whole story about island and uh uh murder and then yeah. His wife turned out to her. I don't think they ever got married, but his wife slash girlfriend turned out to be alive. 
40 mm-hmm. years younger. She was frozen, wasn't she? Yeah, she was in Carbonite. A common, mm-hmm. common problem in Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tony. Our next question, unless you've you found any any reviews, I've got a couple. Yeah, okay. do you want to read them now? Uh, let, we'll do we'll do the emails first, and then get to the reviews afterwards. Maybe. Okay. You you're smirking there. I uh, I don't know. They, they must be. No, 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 no. I'm no? just a happy fellow. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't have sounded less happy saying that. The real happy dude. Uh, you read the next email. I, I'm trying to. I don't have them open. Okay, well, that's the problem that I'm experiencing right now. Get so a grip. Our next question comes from Jacob. Who asks, do you guys think that with the many franchises embracing multiple timelines at the moment, Spider-Man, Halo, TV show, etc., we could finally see a true continuation of Legends? Mm, I think we've talked about that question yeah. a few times. Probably uh, not. I think the, the Spider-Man angle is kind of the, the newest one there, but like even that was bringing in the older stuff to the existing timeline, almost mm-hmm. like to make it seem worth it, they were doing that and like with the multiverse of madness thing, uh, whatever is going to show up in Dr. Strange. It seems like even more of trying to tie things together. Uh, so I, I don't, I, yeah, my thoughts on that haven't really changed from last time. We've said that it's unlikely that legends would get some large scale continuation. Yeah. Um, I went to go, I went to the movie theaters today with my son and Kelsey. I surprised Kelsey by, she thought we were all going to see, um, Sing 2, which is like the, you know, Sing, it's like the, anyway, it's an animated movie with yeah. animals singing. But um, she thought we were all going to that, but I bought her tickets for, uh, she's a huge horror fan, so I bought her tickets for Scream. So she got to watch that instead while well, August and I watched Sing. And then we snuck in to watch a little bit of Spider-Man afterwards because there was literally nobody else in the entire theater complex. Hmm. Yeah, that, so that's the it was... Way. Only Kelsey in her show, only Gus and I in, uh, or me and Gus in, in our show, uh, and nobody in Spider Man, and I didn't see anybody else besides the workers there. It was crazy. I don't know how theaters are surviving. It, they can't even sell their food, which is where they make most of their money. I don't know if they're getting oh, yeah. like anything out of digital. Food in. Like maybe they're getting something out of digital sales, but I don't think anyone wants to support them that way. So I, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's movie theaters are basically the cruise ships of land. Like the the industry that is probably gonna be least similar at the actually, you know what? That that's bullshit because it as soon as it opens up, it, it's always full anyway. So Yeah. Never mind. They're both here to stay. I just think people have worse. predicted their death, theater death, but yeah. Spider Man did numbers, which Yeah. All the Marvel movies that have come out in in the pandemic have done really well, despite the fact that like I don't think Eternals did that well, did it? It it didn't do like fantastic, especially in uh, in reception, but like it did it did well. I just look at that movie and I'm like, man, I can't imagine anything in my life that I'm less interested in seeing. Than I I like Kumail Nanjiani, so that's like the main reason I want to see it. So. It's on Disney Eternals, Plus. Eternals now, so only made only made four hundred two million. I bet you they were okay. they they probably wanted to hit seven or eight billion, eight hundred billion or million. Did yeah, I say billion? Probably, I meant million. Said. Maybe maybe one billion even. Yeah, but I mean, like accounting for COVID and how yeah. that would impact releases. I don't think any of them have been hugely what surprisingly what, low. I wonder what No Way Home has for. I'm kind of curious what No Way Home's. That's the new one, right? I think it's yeah. Didn't it turn out to be like one of the highest grossing? Yeah, it's at it's at one point six billion already. Jesus. Yeah. Like wow. even I was thinking about going and watching that, and I haven't done a single fucking thing since COVID started. Well, yeah. Seeing how like how chill the theaters were, I'm gonna go next week with Gus. Because like he he, because like I wanted to go, I didn't want to to go enough like to go 
on my own after the kids were asleep, but I also didn't want to take him there if it was going to be like a bunch of nerds who get frustrated mm-hmm. that there's a kid there, even if he's being quiet. So now that I know there's probably going to be literally no one there, I'll just take yeah. him next week probably. Uh, Joel sent in a question, which is about uh, some implications from a new comic, uh, wherein Bane says, or wherein the comic says that eight centuries ago, the Jedi Order ended the, and I quote, rule of the Sith Lord Darth Bane, uh, which Joel is asking what the implications of that could be about like the Sith being in charge of the galaxy. Uh, he's saying, it seems that Bane was not just a member of the Sith of the last Sith Empire pre Phantom Menace, but perhaps its ruler as well as the ruler of the galaxy, the founder of the rule of two. It seems like a major difference compared to his Legends counterpart. It's possible. Definitely possible. Um, there's a few places where like just being but, the active Sith Lord is kind of counted yeah. as a as a rule in itself. So like I think there's some points where like the Sith were definitely not an empire that like the rule of the Sith Lords is still mentioned. So I I wouldn't read too much into it until stories actually get told with it. Yeah. Yeah. Because Bane has like the Jedi know of Bane's death in in Legends 2, right? They just think they don't realize he had an apprentice. Is that right? Yeah, they so. knew they knew he was around. They knew he was a Sith Lord because they they're hunting him and I I think they're semi aware of Xana, but it's, well, they think I think they think the Sith did it with him because yeah. remember the yeah. But, but I think yeah. they I think they think they killed both of them. Oh, okay, gotcha. That like sense. Xana was at the fight on Tython as well, or no? Is that the one but, where yeah. they have the big battle against the four masters? Yeah, the RPG the, battle the where the Athorian the force screams. Yeah, <laughs> the Athorian is uh is just spamming the his buff spell. Yeah. Uh, our next question comes from Khalil, who says, Dark greetings. Today, I'm wondering what your favorite faction in Star Wars and would they win a war against a real world army? Mine's the Galactic Republic and the Galactic spaceships, Empire. So yes. Yeah, one Star Destroyer wipes us all out. Uh, someone, I think, should make a video about uh, Star Destroyer versus the entire United States military. I think that could paid do for well. Paid for my son's university with that video. <laughs> <laughs> He's got two million views. <laughs> I mean, some, some fat that slugs are about that, to pay for that, your daughter's university. <laughs> That and the Jabba video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like they eventually become aware of the rule of two because Yoda talks about it, but Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, I my favorite's the New Republic from Legends. And yeah. They've got spaceships, so they can win. Yeah. Aesthetically I like the CIS the most, like the the ship designs. I don't it's like the you're, most of you're the faction, corp but... you're a corpo fascist. No. Uh definitely not. Uh, you I, know, you know I just really like our sponsors. Totally been into NFTs, right? Oh, absolutely! Every Lucre Hulk gets minted as an NFT, <laughs> and then the server holding the link dies, and no one knows who owns what anymore. Oh my God, did you see Twitter's allowing NFT profile pictures now? <laughs> the I'm old article joking. they had about the uh, Twitter adding X profile verification for people who it's okay to harass. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was fucking hilarious. <laughs> It's funny too because like the whole thing about like NFTs, it's like the the only distinguishing factor is like it's like an octagon or a hexagon, like instead yeah. of a circle. But like you can just add that in in Paint or Photoshop. Yeah. Like you know, like the second those are released, you're gonna be able to look up Twitter NFT mask and download it and put it over your picture, and then also download someone's NFT. Yeah, but what and... if someone's got like a, a plugin on their browser that they're browsing in uh, in dark mode, or you're on dark mode on on your uh, on your phone i don't think png transparency works on twitter avatars no you'd have to either i i personally i think dark mode is more common so i would go for the dark mode mask yeah if you i don't yeah there, there's got to be a non-zero amount of people who are like very interested in the nft side of it and just can't get it so they try to fake having an nft thing oh yeah for sure yeah i don't have forty thousand dollars to spend on this picture of a dog that's sadder than that's sadder than actually getting it um twitter is really annoying with nfts like do you ever get like notifications on your phone where it's like someone you know is hosting one of the spaces or whatever and it's always nft bullshit 
Yeah, I haven't had that. Uh, I guess so I don't... ads as well for like this goat NFT. I'm like, I don't follow anyone who like does any either, NFT like... stuff, so I, I don't get any spaces for that. And I'd probably unfollow if it was like, oh, your friend is in this thing about it. But like, I do follow Dan Olson, uh, foldable or folding ideas, mm-hmm. and he's doing a video on it soon. So he like shows up in like top in NFT influencer lists that are auto generated or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he gets, he has an ongoing thread about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know, man. <laughs> but our next email comes from Christopher, who says, Reading through Bantam and NJO Star Wars, I tend to flip opinion on whether or not Bors Felia was a well written antagonist or a character shoved in the role just to make the hero's effort more difficult and act as a hate sink. The quality of the books tend to make him lean heavily one way or the other. In your opinion, how well written is Borsk as a character and antagonist? I mean, I think you kind of said it right there. Like, there's some books where, you know, you can either see he's being manipulated or you can at least understand where he's coming from. Like, I think in the original Thrawn trilogy, you hate him as a character, but I don't really get the feeling in that, um, in the original Thrawn trilogy, that he's being written just to soak up hate. Um, But yeah, there's definitely other other books where he's he's kind of just against the the good guys because that's the thing to do like i always talk with the example i don't know if borsk failure is in this book but in the new rebellion that's one example where there's clearly political opposition to leia and it just doesn't make sense like in that book the big argument is that it was han who bombed the senate i believe Mm. which like just doesn't make any sort of sense at all yeah um so sometimes i think like the the new republic working against the good guys or the the ga working against the good guys is it can work or it can just be frustrating i think it works well in something like the swarm war as well um or like even legacy of the force i think that can be interesting or fate of the jedi even um sometimes it's just frustrating yeah i feel a little bit differently about borsk where like the Thrawn trilogy is one of the places where I feel like he's most there just to be an obstacle uh-huh. where he's like putting his uh, his own goals above the New Republic in such a clearly mm-hmm. obvious way that like because mm-hmm. uh, like the same thing is done with Larry and Crefay in the X-Wing books and there's like he's like directly modeled off of Borsk more or less. And it kind mm-hmm. of messes up portrayals of Borth or not messes up, but like it it does really shoehorn portrayals of Bothans into that. For a mm-hmm. lot of the next little while and force kind of comes out of that more the longer he goes on there's still some authors that are using him more as a, uh or still just using him as a an obstacle in the way but there are some some books especially the farther in you go that try to characterize him a little bit more with his own uh with more justifiable reasons for maybe acting the way he does or try to redeem him in some way whereas in the Thrawn trilogy he was kind of just there to be a symbol of the of how easy it is for Thrawn to manipulate the New Republic. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, I, th- I think that's that's fair. Do we, have any, do we have any more questions? I believe we do. We have one more from Hans who says, "Been a fan." I can read. Uh, you might want to check your power supply or your <laughs> processor. <laughs> I've been a huge fan of you guys for years and have been listening to the podcast ever since Truce at Bakura. It makes me wow. sad that I won't be able to listen to you guys for a while because in a few days I start my basic training. My question is, what are some of your earliest memories of watching Star Wars for the first time and what made you get hooked on it? For me, I remember watching A New Hope with my dad when I was around five. It's one of my favorite memories. Thank you. Well, best of luck yeah. with that. Hope you can... Yeah, best of luck. Hopefully you can get through it. I mean, I, I've heard it's not fun. But yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That's I've heard it's not fun. <laughs> um, my memory I th- may have told the story, but my dad explained. He, I I actually remember exactly where I was, and my dad told me about Star Wars. They used to have a, a water bed. Did your parents have a water bed, Corey? Uh, my parents did not have water beds. Uh, well, my not my while dad, I knew my them, parents, at least. My, my parents did, and I remember lying okay, in the we'll water fucking bed. Fucking brag about it. Yeah, it was, it was sick. And my dad was telling me about Star Wars. 
It's one of my first memories because I must have been only three or four. And he was telling me about Chewbacca and he described him as a lion, a bear, and something else, which I think was just a, a kind of mistelling of something George Lucas said or was kind of something that had been around at the time. But anyway, he was like, He was like, a lion, a witch, and a wardrobe. It was yeah. all in one. <laughs> yeah, he, well, he's like, he's a lion, he's a gorilla, and he's like, whatever else. So we had a VHS player and my dad borrowed. Um, for some reason, Empire Strikes Back was the first one I remember seeing. He borrowed that from his boss. Um, and I remember for a while, that was the only one we had. And I used to lie upside down on the couch, like Luke at the very end, to see if I could have survived, like hanging upside down from the weather vane. Mm-hmm. I, I wasn't going to make it. And then eventually we got the... We got first got just one of the original trilogy box sets. Then we got the silver version, which was like one of the first special edition ones Mm -hmm. um the best special edition one and yeah i used to watch those every day yeah uh the first time i ever did i actually i got a a weird a big c3po head that did something from a gift exchange at my dad's work once it was before i liked star wars i still thought star wars was just weird nerd shit that i had no interest in uh but the first time i actually watched the star wars movie i went to my cousin's house and he had uh, the Phantom Menace on tape. So I thought we'd just watch it and make fun of it. But then it was like, oh, this is actually pretty epic. So I watched Phantom Menace. Uh, I, I, didn't, I knew that Darth Vader was Luke's father. I didn't know that Darth Vader was Anakin Skywalker or what an Anakin Skywalker was. So I was watching it thinking like, oh, is this like Luke's son or something? What's the relationship there? Uh, hmm. So after I watched episode one with my cousin, I got the box set uh, of the original trilogy as well. Uh, it was like the one with the the white sleeve with the middle sections that were see through. But mm. yeah, which one? I don't know that one. I had a silver one. It made a farting sound when you closed it because the air would get pushed in. It yeah. was it was sick. Maybe I maybe I had that one too. I might be thinking of something else, but it, like uh, it, 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 it. Hold on, I got it. I've got it here somewhere. Oh, I can go get it. One second. Keep talking. But yeah, so I, I got I got those, and then I just got a. I really got into the books. Like for a lot of people, uh, or unlike a lot of people, my connection to everything. Like I, I obviously really like the movies, but I was always more connected to the books, and I think I read. Uh, either star by star or some other njo book first and that like star by star is super deep into the njo so uh i i was kind of lost on everything going on and i i still just got into it because i really liked how big the universe was and that there were 500 books i could read because i was reading way more than was healthy i think but that was sorry i I accidentally described the gold version the gold version has this box and is that the is that dvds or vhs's (laughs) VHSs. I think I had, I had a DVD version that looked like that. Afterwards. This was the nine. Yeah, there was a there, there was a, a DVD version. This was the ninety eight one, I think, or mm. ninety seven. So it, it's the best because it's got like the. Well, I like some of the special edition changes, like the graphical fixes and like yeah the new music for Return of the Jedi, but doesn't have like it, it has still has like Sebastian Sh- Shaw at the end. I almost said Shabbat, Sebastian Stan. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and they fixed the the bug on Bespin where you can no clip through the wall. That was a good fix too. <laughs> where Bespin has no windows at all and yeah. might as well be underground. <laughs> all right. Reviews. What do we okay. got? We got a few here. Um let me just okay. So we've got this one that's just a splendid. Tapcap is my favorite ca- Canadian life and occasionally Star Trek, Wars, Gate, Halo podcast. I read a ten maple syrup covered hockey players out of ten. That's from Ace of Spade. Space. Um, this one, which I appreciate, is right to the point. It says, not lame. And then it says, it is good. Five stars. Nice. Um, this one, I don't know if I've read it before, but it's worth reading again. Uh, five stars. It says, a great comfort. As a crab, as I crab across the field, that is great comfort. Ugh, okay. Sorry. As I crab across the field, this is great comfort and distraction from the pain of from carrying my tenor drums. 
I don't know if there was like some biblical character who was like sentenced to a life of carrying tenor drums across a field. Who's that from? C. Mober. Is that a reference to the guy with backwards legs? Which guy? Is it McCamber Lecto though that has the weird legs? I don't know. I don't know. Thank you either way. And we've got uh, another one. This is a long time coming. This is a good podcast for learning about or reminiscing on the old EU stories. Corey and his young co-host, Justin, I'm actually a little bit older than Corey, just a couple of weeks, are Canadian, but don't hold don't hold that against them too much. Justin manages to ensure they're more red-green, <laughs> more red-green than Jacob Tutu. That is funny. Uh, <laughs> so the cringe factor usually isn't too bad. Overall, they excel at providing insight and context into legends that you can't get from just skimming wikipedia summaries of events that's kind of nice if you're like me and spent the preteen early periods of your star wars admiration reading through random wikipedia articles oh uh, we did ask said, for crab as one of the oh okay that was our fault we need to keep a record yeah that being said they're pretty good if you actually read the book of the week as well as far as i know this is the only star wars podcast so if you need your star wars fix will you work out <laughs> in quotation marks you can either listen to these two <laughs> giga chats talking about the shape of water subplot of the galaxy far far away you never knew a boot or you can listen to white noise and try to imagine you can hear voices talking about how bantam originally intended to absorb the hut's revenge use characters from the droids <laughs> cartoon specifically just to screw with a similar <laughs> project from dark horse or something <laughs> I don't know if that's real, but it just sounds so real. That <laughs> Those are your two options. <laughs> Remember to keep your ear up for Justin doing his little Kermit hmm sound from time to time. I think that's me. That's from uh, Gowan Fishing. That's hilarious. That's great. Or Gowan Fishing. I mean, I've always looked up to Jacob Tutu, so I wouldn't have minded it either way. But man, that is like one thing. For those who don't know, Jacob Tutu, it's a cart. It was a cartoon, right? And yeah. maybe books uh, about a little kid named Jacob Tutu. I think he was a hockey goalie, right? Remembering that? Am I remembering that correctly? I think he was a yeah, he was a goalie, wasn't he? But are you sure? Are you thinking of a... Curtis Joseph? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not thinking of Cujo. That's very different. He would say everything twice. So I I always uh as someone well, who does it's funny that. too because there was also an NHL player called Jordan Tutu. Um it was, like, it was, was a so... Mordecai Richler based thing, I think. Oh yeah, but... I just googled it. It was. I I could swear he was a goalie. I just I think I just remember him wearing goalie pads. I could be wrong. Jacob Tutu goalie. All right. Oh, well, yeah, there you go. As we as we leave off on a note of Canadiana as usual, that's going to do it for this week of Tap Calf Transmissions. In two minutes, we are scheduled to go and sail the high seas and Sea of Thieves with Charlie on X2. Uh, as we well talk as for me, my uses. download didn't finish yet. It didn't finish yet? Wow. You're uh, all those times telling Charlie to be prepared before the stream. And... I know. I even started it like half an hour. Well, half an hour before stream started. So yeah. didn't think it would take that long. Yeah, it's a it's a big game with nothing to do. So <laughs> come and watch us get drunk and sail on a thumbnail that I spent way too long working on and still came out Ooh. mediocre. Let me see but, this. All right, all, let me see just how all right. how mediocre this is before we end it. Okay. Is it live? Is it live like scheduled? Yeah, yeah. See, I just did it again. I, I tutooed myself. Yeah, that's that's fairly mediocre. That's not bad though. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye.